Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Tom Hodge and I'm the chair of the Russian department at Wellesley College. It's a delight and an honor for me to introduce to you Dr. Katerina Nikitska, who is zooming in for us this evening from Borispil, Ukraine, which is uh, just southeast of Kyiv. Um, so I'm sure we're all very grateful to her for joining us in what is for her the middle of the night. Uh, Dr. Nikitska was educated at the Dragomanov Ukrainian State University in Kyiv. She received her doctorate at the Department of World Literature and Literary Theory. Um, and her thesis for that degree was the genre of narrative poem in Nikolai Gumilyov's works. She uh, specializes in Russian literature, specifically on the poetry of Nikolai Gumilyov, on whom she is one of the world's leading experts. Uh, and Dr. Nikitska works as an assistant professor now at Dragomanov Ukrainian State University in Kiev uh, in the World Literature and Theory Department, where she teaches courses on the literature of modernism and the literature of the 19th century, especially realist literature. Dr. Nikitska has a distinguished record of publications. I won't mention them all now, but I'll summarize by saying that she has eight excellent articles on Nikolai Gumilyov uh, published in distinguished journals and books in Ukraine, in Poland, in Russia, and in Armenia. This evening, Dr. Nikitska will be delivering a lecture entitled Gumilyov and Gilgamesh, an epic story. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Katerina Nikitska. Hello, everyone. Hello, Tom. Hello, Katie. I'm uh, really happy to see you here today, and uh, it's an honor for me uh, to talk to you um, uh, because, um, as far as I know, uh, your uh, department is uh, connected to Vladimir Nabokov, and uh, I see, <laughs> yeah, I see uh, the tradition of uh, Russian literature in exile in it, uh, because now in Ukraine we unfortunately uh, don't have much possibility to study Russian literature as it uh, gets uh, banned and excluded from uh, school and university programs. So for me, it's a great opportunity to share what I do and uh, to talk about important things for me. So thank you for giving me this opportunity and for support. I'm uh, really grateful to Wellesley College and to your department, Tom, uh, for giving me this uh, time to talk about uh, yeah, the author I cherish the most. Uh, well, uh, I want to be uh, um, talking uh, yeah, too long, and uh, let's begin uh, and talk about Gumilyov and Gilgamesh, an epic story. Uh, why I named uh, my, my talk an epic story? Because uh, I think that um, those two personalities I'm going to talk about, uh, modernist poet and um, ancient hero, uh, they are both uh, extraordinary personalities. Uh, and uh, I think in some points they are uh, interesting for today's listeners, for today's audience. And uh, at some points they are really close. So let's see um, and find out what can be in common between a modernist poet and ancient hero. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I want to tell you about Nikolai Gumilov and um, why I actually study this poet and uh, why I'm so fascinated by uh, his works. Uh, I uh, want to begin with a quote uh, from uh, his um, poem, uh, from his sonnet, uh, probably uh, the most famous one. It's called I'm a Conquistador in Iron Mail. Uh, this uh, image of a uh, brave man who explores the world uh, stuck to uh, Gumilov and uh, sometimes he hated it, sometimes he used it. But anyway, uh, this poet is a poet explorer and a poet warrior. And uh, his life is like an adventure movie or adventure novel. And it's worth, uh, uh, yeah, it's worth studying. Uh, so uh, I'll read uh, these uh, lines and explain uh, the concept of this personality. So, if it's a harder fate that I may think to lose the last reluctant letter thing, 
uh, then let this come, I'll summon it, you'll see. I'll struggle it uh, till, the destined, till the destined end. Perhaps the hand that I went that extent will get the light blue lily mint for me. So uh, these uh, uh, lines, uh, the last lines of probably his most famous uh, poem, uh, describe his personality, always uh, in search of something special, always in search of some uh, spiritual growth and, uh, and some uh, epiphanies. Uh, so let's talk about um, Gumilev's uh, life and uh, work. Uh, so uh, he lived a uh, really short uh, life, only 35 years, uh, but uh, yet so uh, extraordinary and um, uh, really um, prominent life. Uh, he was born in 1996 in Kronstadt. It's a port town near St. Petersburg. It was Russian Empire and um, he was a really um, big boy with some health problems. Uh, but uh, from the very uh, childhood, uh, he had a really vivid imagination. Uh, he admired adventure books and uh, started writing uh, poetry really early at a really early age. Uh, he publishes uh, his first uh, poetry works in Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, at around um, 14 or so years old. Uh, so, um, and um, from the very early years, uh, his um, poetic world um, begins to um, appear, appear and uh, develop. And uh, the topics, uh, I'm going uh, to talk about them a bit later, uh, the topics for his work is uh, adventure and exploring the world, uh, nature, uh, running away from cities and uh, being a wanderer who uh, learns about this world and about, uh, and about this world uh, wonders. Uh, so he starts writing and um, in his student years, uh, he uh, goes to Paris, uh, attends lecture at Sorbonne University uh, and starts his own uh, literary magazine where he publishes mostly his own works uh, and um, dives completely in um, modernist literary uh, life and uh, attends exhibitions, attends uh, cultural events and thus um, becomes really cul culturally aware person. And uh, later when he found a new uh, poetic movement, Acmeism, uh, their motto uh, was like longing for the world uh, culture. Uh, so these early years in Paris, um, um, influenced uh, future poetry uh, concepts um, that Gumilev invented when he created his new poetic movement. Uh, he also married Anna Akhmatova, uh, one of the most prominent Russian poets of the 20th century. Uh, their marriage uh, didn't last long, but uh, they remained good friends and allies in poetic life and um, allies in um, developing a new literary movement again. Uh, their son, uh, Lev, later became a famous historian, ethnologist, and anthropologist. Uh, so uh, Gumilev's family uh, was really famous and is really famous. Uh, and um, he always uh, tried to surround himself with uh, some special people and prominent people. Uh, during his uh, young uh, years, um, he, he was also fascinated with Africa and uh, traveled there several times. Um, and uh, one of which was an expedition for um, anthropology museum. And uh, in, during this expedition, he brought a really um, uh, valuable uh, things for the museum collection. Uh, he brought some um, artworks of um, local uh, tribes and uh, nations. Uh, he brought some uh, things and uh, really um, his collection that he brought from Africa uh, is uh, one of the most interesting and one of the most uh, rich if uh, to talk about ethnography in uh, Russian museums. Um, so his passion um, for exploration 
uh, turned into um, several travels to Africa and even travels as uh, not as just a traveler, but as a scientist, as a ethnographer and anthropologist. So he not just uh, looked at what and the places he visited, but also uh, studied them and explored them from the point of uh, academic view. Um, when um, talking about his literary tastes, uh, he uh, was initially attracted to the symbolist movement. Uh, this movement was inspired by French poets like uh, Baudelaire, uh, Rimbaud, uh, Verlaine, uh, etc. And uh, symbolists uh, tend to uh, use uh, unclear um, imagery in their poetry, uh, to um, use uh, some mystic um, sujet and um, imagery and um, when symbolism uh, just begins to fade and uh, begins to fall in some crisis um, Gumilev uh, develops acmeism uh, a new poetic school uh, which uh, claims a really different principles um, they uh, acmeists they refused uh, symbolist mysticism and um, unclear imagery and uh, proclaim that a poet should be like a master, like a craftsman uh, who crafts excellent works and who uh, refers to real life and not some higher materials, higher issues, uh, but to real life and um, in all its of its sides in all of its uh, kinds and ways uh, and um, moreover uh, Gumilev starts a poetic school uh, where he uh, teaches young poets and explains uh, them principles of poetry uh, explains them uh, how a really good verse should look like and teaches them uh, what to write about and how to write about so it was not only just a literary movement, but also um, a school for young poets. And uh, really, uh, next generation of Akmeist poets, um, afterwards, they became really famous. And uh, even after Gumilev's death, they continue um, implementing his principles in poetry. Um, when uh, the World War uh, One started, Gumilev um, became a part of cavalry. Uh, he uh, actually, um, as he didn't have really good health, uh, he wasn't uh, a good rider, but he uh, had a really uh, strong will and he trained and managed uh, to become an officer and um, all, uh, all the period he was at war, uh, he spent riding and uh, Ahmatova uh, remembers that um, he really um, developed his skills and managed uh, to uh, perfect them. And for his bravery, he was even invested with two uh, St. George crosses. Uh, those are uh, military awards in Russian Empire. Uh, so he even got awarded for his uh, activity at war. Uh, and finally, um, after uh, the um, uh, World uh, War uh, One ended, he spent some time in Europe. Uh, he um, communicates with uh, European intellectuals, writers, uh, for example, with Herbert Chesterton in Britain, and um, spends some time in London um, and in Paris, but uh, terribly misses his own country. and. Um, after uh, the revolution, he uh, decides to return to St. Petersburg. Uh, moreover, uh, there was Anna Akhmatova with his son, and he wanted uh, to see his family. Uh, that's why he decides um, to return. Uh, though he uh, um, didn't support the Bolsheviks, and um, of course he uh, blames uh, killing the Tsar family, uh, so uh, it was really dangerous for him to return, but he uh, decided to do this and um, um, after that spent some time in St. Petersburg, uh, continues working as a poet 
and as a translator he translates um, a lot of uh, poetic works uh, for example um, from french poetry uh, from german poetry and um, um, continues to uh, lead his um, his poetry activities and um, in uh, 1921 being only 35 years old he was arrested and executed by the Chika. Uh, Chika was a kind of a secret police uh, that uh, followed uh, those who did not agree with uh, the new authorities and uh, he spent some time in prison um, was charged of participation in an anti-Soviet conspiracy uh, whose existence is still not proven. So, uh, so far, uh, there is no um, direct evidence that this conspiracy existed. And Gumilov um, even uh, didn't write any uh, literary work that uh, was against Soviet authority. So he even uh, didn't express his uh, views in poetry. So he was uh, arrested absolutely for nothing and uh, killed and um, no one knows uh, even where he was buried and uh, where he died. Uh, because uh, there uh, were several places in St. Petersburg uh, for executions and uh, no one exactly knows where Gumilov was executed. Um, so tragic uh, fate and um, at such a young age he dies. Uh, but um, there is uh, memories from one of um, the Cheka team who um, held this uh, execution. And he remembers that uh, Gumilov uh, really died like a brave man. Uh, he didn't beg, he didn't um, fear. He, was, uh, he acted really calm. And even uh, the Cheka executors admired his bravery and his willpower and his moral strength. Uh, so um, really a wonderful fate because uh, this man uh, took part in uh, one of the greatest wars and survived. Uh, he went to uh, Somalia to cannibal tribes and survived, but uh, he was killed by his own country uh, just for nothing and just for uh, non-proven conspiracy. Uh, well, but um, brief, but really, um, rich um, and um, intense life he led. And uh, here uh, I made a little um, yeah, collage uh, out of some pictures that could uh, illustrate his uh, poetry themes. And I wrote uh, the main themes around these pictures so you can see. Um, so what was he writing about? Of course, uh, he was fascinated by uh, traveling, by uh, different countries, ex especially exotic countries like African countries, Asia, uh, North and uh, South America, uh, all that has rich nature and um, exotic culture, I mean exotic for European person. Uh, so he of course wrote about exploration and about um, going somewhere uh, sailing somewhere or riding somewhere uh, and um, uh, finding new worlds. Uh, another uh, his um, point of interest was the ancient world, um, especially ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and ancient Mesopotamia, which we are going to discuss later, um, and all that uh, is ancient, all ancient cultures. Um, and Indian culture too, and uh, so all um, yeah, ancient and um, countries that contributed to development of the civilization. Uh, different cultures, nature, adventure, um, art, yeah, the nature of art, uh, war, of course, because uh, he was participant of war and um, also he wrote about war um, in the context of ancient world, like Roman uh, Empire. Um, also, a large part of his text uh, is devoted to spiritual growth and uh, esotericism and searching for um, ways for spiritual evolution. Uh, he believed that poetry is a magical thing that can uh, help people grow mentally and uh, spiritually. And uh, he uh, claimed that poets are like druids, like um, some 
um, religious workers uh, that uh, help people uh, to grow uh, through reading poetry and um, devouring poetry. Uh, of course, he wrote about love. Um, he had numerous affairs, um, though he wasn't really a uh, handsome man. A lot of uh, his, uh, con a lot of people who knew him um, remembered that he wasn't really handsome. He wasn't. He didn't have uh, really uh, nice hair. Uh, he had some problems with his eyes, like astigmatism. Uh, so um, he wasn't conventionally beautiful, uh, so to say. Uh, but he had numerous affairs, and women really adored him. And um, he met all the actresses that uh, lived in uh, St. Petersburg at that time. Um, he uh, had some affairs in uh, artistic and literary work. Uh, so he, of course, he uh, wrote a lot about um, love and relationship too. And of course, um, about women's beauty, uh, because a large part of his works connected to um, medieval uh, times and um, topics and Renaissance uh, topics. And uh, he uh, renewed this tradition to admire women's beauty in poetry, like uh, were done by uh, poets of uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance. Uh, so he had a rich uh, poetic world. And today, uh, so uh, we can talk about this. Uh, topics um, really for a long time, uh, but today I decided to uh, talk about relatively um, non-researched uh, topic in Gumilov's work. Uh, it's a Mesopotamian topic. Uh, a lot of researchers um, studied his African motifs in poetry, Indian motifs, uh, again, some um, poetry about exploration, uh, but so far, uh, not so many um, researchers turned to uh, his um, Mesopotamian motives and to his um, um, works in terms of translating the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, so uh, who was uh, Gilgamesh and uh, why actually Gumilov was attracted to this personality? Um, the definition of this ancient hero is he who saw everything. Um, Gilgamesh is the hero of one of the oldest literary texts. Uh, the epic was written um, around uh, 2000 BC, so it's really ancient and uh, one of the first uh, written uh, works, literary works. Uh, he was um, a hero of ancient Mesopotamian mythology. And possibly he had the prototype, a real um, king of a state city Uruk uh, in Mesopotamia. And um, he uh, was remembered as a really fierce and um, powerful uh, ruler. And uh, his image as a uh, god protector, hero protector, um, remain in mythology. Uh, but um, some researchers say that he was a real person. Uh, you can see uh, um, his image uh, where he is holding a lion, real scale lion, uh, and that demonstrates his uh, extreme power. And in the epic, it is told that he was uh, two thirds God and one third uh, human being. So not totally God and not totally person, not totally human. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh consists of uh, the 12 tables uh, that depict uh, heroic deeds of Gilgamesh and his uh, companion and Kido. And um, also uh, it uh, describes uh, Gilgam Gilgamesh's uh, quest for immortality uh, because um, he is not a uh, god, yeah, only two swords god, and he is uh, mortal. That's why he searches for uh, eternal life and um, goes yeah, to a man who knows um, how to reach this eternal life. And also, uh, this um, epic consists of a flood myth. Um, in Mesopotamian literature, um, knows stories about the flood even before the Bible, and probably um, 
exactly Mesopotamian uh, flood tales um, become the source for the flood tale uh, in the Bible. Uh, there is uh, such uh, opinion about this. Uh, well, um, uh, Gumilov admired ancient cultures, as I've already said, and uh, he read, uh, of course, uh, Greek epics. Uh, he admired the Iliad and even uh, took it uh, with him to uh, World War I. Um, he um, wrote in his memoir that uh, this was the only book um, he took to war. Yeah, the Iliad. Uh, the yeah one of the most ancient book about the war and uh, one of the most eternal book about the war um, but uh, when he reads uh, the epic of Gilgamesh uh, he says that this is even more powerful than the Iliad and he decides to translate this poem um, in the preface uh, for his translation he says that his goal uh, was uh, not to do the accurate uh, academic translation, uh, but to uh, make uh, the poem available for a really a wide circle of readers. So he uh, liked this epic so much that he decided uh, to share it with um, another readers. So that's why he decides to translate it. Um, this decision was also influenced by his um, friend. Vladimir Shileko, uh, who was a famous Assyriologist, and he uh, knew Akkadian language, and he could translate uh, directly from the cuneiform tablet. So you can see uh, on the picture uh, how it looked like a uh, clay tablet with um, pressed symbols, special symbols uh, that are called cuneiform. Uh, so Shileko uh, translated um, Epic of Gilgamesh and even um, was preparing to publish it. And um, on some uh, poetry evenings uh, made by Gumilov Shileko, uh, read uh, some parts from his translation. And uh, this was the moment uh, when Gumilov decided to make his, uh, to make his own translation uh, and to make his own version. Uh, but uh, since Gumilov didn't know how to read QNA form, he didn't know Akkadian, of course, uh, he wasn't an Assyriologist, uh, so he decides to use a uh, French translation that um, uh, was published in 1907 uh, in Paris uh, and um, uses the French translation. Uh, here you can see uh, um, the page, uh, front page. Uh, this is the digital copy of uh, this translation. I uh, use it for my work. I was lucky to find it in a digital version. Uh, so Gumilov used French text to create his own uh, version of Gilgamesh. Uh, here you can see um, how it looks like it's um, transcription in, in Latin letters. And uh, on the right, it's French text. Uh, of course, I don't know Akkadian too. I um, don't know how to read cuneiform. And like Gumilov, I also read only French part, yeah, the right part, uh, to compare uh, the French uh, translation uh, with Gumilov's translation. So basically, I read two texts, uh, French and Russian, and um, compared them. Um, of course, um, Clay tablets are really a fragile material, and uh, there are a lot of uh, lacunas and uh, a lot of words, a lot of fragments are missing. And uh, that's why it's really hard to make a complete uh, translation. And uh, knowing this, uh, Gumilov tries to uh, fill these lacunas uh, on his own way. Uh, like um, how he saw this, and he tries to uh, he tried to combine the episodes uh, to uh, make some um, coherent story um, and to use all um, separate elements uh, to make some logical story uh, to uh, reconstruct um, the plot of this epic. So here you can see the picture uh, from the digital copy I used. Um, so, um, Epic of Gilgamesh uh, consists of 12 
uh, clay tablets. You can see the list um, here on the screen. And uh, basically, um, we can um, we can see three parts in this epic. Uh, first, it's introducing Gilgamesh as a ruler of uh, Uruk, the yes, city-state, and uh, he is really harsh with uh, his uh, subjects. Uh, he forces a man to go to war. Uh, he uh, rapes all maidens in the city. So God decides to punish him and make um, another uh, man uh, named Eabani or Enkidu in, in other translations. And Eabani uh, has to fight Gilgamesh, so Gilgamesh won't uh, hurt his subjects in, in Uruk city. Um, but um, uh, when um, Gilgamesh and Eabani, they meet and they fight, and later they become friends and companions. And after that, uh, they um, decide to kill a monster uh, named uh, Humbaba um, and do this together. Uh, so uh, most of uh, the epic um, tells the story on how um, Gilgamesh and Eabani go to kill Humbaba and uh, how uh, Eabani uh, dies after that. And uh, after the death of his companion, uh, Gilgamesh uh, turns to uh, search of immortality because he's, uh, he's scared of death, um, seeing how his friend uh, died. And uh, he wants to search uh, this immortality and um, to find the secret of um, eternal life. Uh, so he uh, um, goes and searches um, a man named Utnapishtim, uh, who is immortal. He survived the flood, because all, all episodes, they're actually connected. Uh, Utnapishtim survives the flood, uh, and uh, Gilgamesh goes to see him uh, to find out the mystery of eternal life. And uh, But unfortunately, um, Utnapishtim tells that everyone is mortal, and you, Gilgamesh, you uh, didn't find, uh, you won't find any way uh, to become immortal. Uh, and so uh, Gilgamesh returns um, and um, he didn't obtain the secret of immortal life. And uh, the last part of story, it's um, visiting Eabani in the underworld. And uh, Eabani to uh, tells his friend um, how it looks like in the uh, world of death, uh, what they do. And uh, this is description of the underworld and description of what um, happens to a human after death, according to uh, Mesopotamian mythology, according to Mesopotamian religion. Uh, so uh, three main um, parts in the epic, like uh, killing Humbaba by two companions, a search for um, eternal life and visiting a dead friend in the underworld. So three uh, topical, uh, main topical points. And a brief description you can see <coughs> on the screen. Um, of course, uh, this epic has a lot of repetitions, like uh, all epics, and um, Gumilov uh, omits excessive repetitions and in some way uh, makes um, those parts shorter. Uh, but also he uh, fills lacunas and uh, uses um, separate fragments in his own way. For example, in um, the episode of when Eabani dies, um, he talks about the door, about some door. And there are a lot of missing parts. And um, Gumilov uh, makes it this way that uh, the door is a symbol of uh, turning uh, to afterlife, to another life after death. And thus he transforms this episode into a vision that Eabani sees before he dies. Um, so he transforms some episodes to uh, fulfill and make a more complete picture. And uh, he's trying to guess, actually, uh, the meaning of the episodes. And uh, he's trying to um, 
to guess what uh, initially was uh, set in these clay tablets. Um, well, let's uh, look at some um, changes that he made. Uh, that that he made to uh, lacunas and um, to the text of the poem. Uh, so first of all, he is widening spaces. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, generally, um, when um, the epic tells about Gilgamesh and um, about his explorations and movements, um, ancient writers refer to only uh, city of Uruk or surrounding land. Uh, but uh, Gumilov uh, widens the space and tells that uh, Gilgamesh reaches the edge of the universe. For example, the first lines of the poem uh, describing uh, hero, he who has seen everything of the country, only uh, of uh, his surrounding land. And Gumilov changes this line and writes the one who saw everything to the edge of the universe. So his Gilgamesh is not just local hero, but universal uh, hero who uh, sees everything in the world. So he widens space that is um, reachable by the, by the hero. Uh, in another uh, fragment of all the crowns that have dominated this land since ancient times, etc., and Gumilov changed from all the crowns that reigned in the world. So him. Uh, make these transformations um, uh, several times uh, when French um, translation refers to only country or surrounding lands uh, and Mesopotamia only, uh, Gumilov uh, extends it uh, to the whole uh, world and the whole universe. Uh, another example is um, when um, citizens of Uruk complain to God uh, on uh, Gilgamesh's uh, cruelty. Uh, in uh, French text, their complaint uh, reached, apparently, the gods of the sky. And uh, Gumilov adds their complaint reached the high sky. And there are numerous changes when he adds such um, definitions, uh, high, wide, etc. So uh, in all ways, he widens um, locations and space uh, where um, the hero acts and moves and do his deeds. Uh, another example, when um, Gilgamesh and Eabani go to slay Humbaba to the cedar forest, uh, they look at the height of the cedar, and um, Gumilov adds, and they see huge cedar. So again, he widens and makes uh, the space and surrounding world bigger than it is in initial uh, text and in French translation. Um, moreover, Gumilov um, amplifies emotions. Uh, so when um, ancient author and a French translation uh, writes uh, something neutral about um, a hero's emotion. Uh, Gumilov adds uh, more to it and amplifies um, emotional um, all, all emotional stuff in the poem. For example, when um, Eabani is scared to go and kill Humbaba, uh, he um, yeah, he has flowing hair, and Gumilov transformed this line that his strands uh, of curls are soaked with sweat. So uh, Erbani is so scared that he is soaked with sweat. And um, Gumilov adds this to lacuna, to missing line, to missing words in line. Uh, again, um, when Erbani dies and Gilgamesh mourns his friend, um, Gumilov completes to in complete lines, he tears up and spreads, he removes and yet does something. There are missing parts. And Gumilov writes, he tore his clothes, uh, shed copious tears, dropped the royal signs, mourning his death. Uh, so he extends and describes um, those um, sadness and those mourning in more detailed way. So amplifying emotions uh, after uh, Gilgamesh um, loses his friend. Uh, again, uh, when um, in another episode, when uh, goddess Ishtar, uh, who offers herself to Gilgamesh and um, he refused, 
uh, she threatens and um, asks uh, her father punish Gilgamesh and uh, if uh, her father didn't do this she um, threatens to make uh, to kill people on earth and um, make an apocalypse apocalypse and uh, again uh, Gumilov adds to uh, some missing uh, lines uh, we have only one complete the dead will outnumber the living and Gumilov uh, imagines uh, what um, would Ishtar do if uh, her father uh, didn't punish didn't punish Gilgamesh. I will break the gate that enclose the waters. I will send all the winds across the earthly space, and there will be fewer living than dead. So he extends her fury uh, and describes um, uh, what she would do if uh, she uh, didn't get what she wants, the punishment of uh, Gilgamesh. So he adds more um, more color and more emotion to uh, reactions uh, of, um, of the heroes of the epic. And um, another type of transformation is uh, sacralization. Uh, Gumilov, as a person, as a poet who was uh, fascinated by spiritual growth, and um, spiritual evolution, uh, he um, also uses such um, imagery in his own poetry works, and he adds um, this to his translation too. Uh, for example, um, in the epic, we don't know um, in the line uh, the shape of uh, his body, means uh, of uh, Gilgamesh body, uh, but Gumilov adds that his body is as bright as a big star. Uh, so um, he makes Gilgamesh like like a god uh, who has a body like um, like a big star and um, adds some stellar symbolism and some um, godlike imagery to his uh, appearance. Uh, again, uh, when um, he writes about Uruk, city of Uruk. Uh, he adds um, the word blessed to the lines where he mentioned this city. And in the French translation, we have only he made a wall to encircle Uruk. So no, um, no adjectives around. Yeah. And uh, Gumilov adds uh, the adjective blessed and um, always um, adds this adjective to the name of the city. Uh, so um, in Gumilov's version, uh, Uruk is sacred city, which is blessed by gods, and um, in numerous episodes he used this word to describe this city. Um, again, um, when in um, original text we have storehouse of one of the goddesses, and uh, this storehouse is has foundation like copper, uh, Gumilov transform a storehouse to temple. Uh, for the pure temple of Holy Eana, he gilded the foundation, which is harder than copper. So he transforms storehouse, probably um, it was something like a um, temple for, uh, I don't know, harvesting and um, good uh, crops. But uh, Gumilov transforms this line and um, makes this look like a temple and some sacred place. So he adds more sacred symbolism uh, to uh, usual things that mentioned that are mentioned in the epic and uh, a really interesting episode that fascinated me is when uh, Gilgamesh um, in search of immortality he uh, travels to um, different country he travels to distant mountains he sees and he sees a magic tree, a tree of the gods. And in this episode, as you see, we have only five lines. I didn't write here uh, French and Russian text because it's um, too much for one slide. Uh, but uh, here, uh, Gumilov transforms the, those five lines in 12 lines and gives a really uh, detailed description of this um, tree of the gods and uh, he writes the name for this tree it's like apple tree and he writes uh, what uh, fruit grows on 
on the branches and uh, some uh, precious stones around these branches. So he transforms um, the imagery of uh, this um, paradise tree, magic tree, and probably uh, in this fragment he refers to a Christian symbol is because you know apple tree um, often appears as a tree from paradise yeah from um, from story about adam and eve and um, for some reason gumbilov decides to extend the description of this magic tree and probably to um, use some um, symbolism about christian paradise or some christian uh, imagery uh, for his translation. So um, Gilgamesh sees not just a tree, uh, but something uh, magical, uh, some magic apple tree uh, that is embellished with uh, precious stones. So it's really uh, one of the most mysterious episodes uh, in the in Gumilov's translations, and um, I think it's really worth uh, further thinking because um, this really untypical for Gumilov, who um, in general uh, really uh, precisely follows the French text. And here, for some reason, he decides to extend this description, uh, probably to uh, describe this place as something sacred, maybe analog of Christian paradise or something like this, um, and turn his Gilgamesh to some uh, yeah, Christian religion. Okay, and um, I see that um, uh, we have some time in and I'm going to um, finish and yep, to end my speech for today. Uh, so why uh, Gumilov chose as Gilgamesh and uh, why, um, why they are similar, those two men, uh, poet and uh, ancient hero. Uh, in one of his um, verses, Kumilov writes that he is polite with life of hard modernity. Uh, between us two, uh, there is a border. Uh, he always uh, mark, uh, really marks a border between uh, modern life and his um, own um, uh, poetry world and his inner uh, world. So probably uh, his uh, passion for ancient epics and ancient mythology is a way to uh, distance from this modernity that is not um, uh, as heroic as, um, as heroes of ancient epics. And uh, why uh, Gumilov and Gilgamesh may be similar? Um, I have uh, a quote from um, the book by Samuel Kramer, and uh, he writes that Gilgamesh uh, became the hero par excellence of the ancient world, an adventurous, brave, but tragic figure uh, symbolizing man's vain but endless drive for fame, glory, and immortality. I think those words uh, may refer to Nikolai Gumilov too, because he also was a tragic figure, and he also was adventurous and uh, brave. And he also uh, searched for fame and immortality in some way, uh, because he um, wanted to find a way how to uh, influence minds through poetry. And he uh, wanted to remain uh, in ages and um, wanted to leave some really valuable poetic work. Uh, so I think in this, um, case, uh, Gilgamesh and Gumilov, they are similar. Uh, both were searching for um, immortality in this world, and um, both uh, tried to um, reveal the mystery of life. And another quote is uh, from uh, Gumilov's article, Acmeism and the Legacy of Symbolism. It's a poetic manifesto that um, depicts uh, Gumilov's vision of poetry. And here he writes, our duty, our freedom, our joy, and our tragedy is to guess each hour uh, what the next um, hour may be for us, for our cause, for the whole world, and to hurry its coming. And for our highest reward, never suspend an attention for a moment, but dream of the image of the last hour, which will never arrive. 
Uh, so um, this um, again, this quest and this um, question of uh, what will be next and um, how the life ends and uh, how to um, get the most out of uh, every minute. I think uh, this uh, resembles uh, searches of Gilgamesh who wants to uh, understand why we are uh, mortal, why we uh, don't have eternal life and um, why we just can't live forever and um, get the most out of every moment. Uh, so in this uh, search of immortality and in this bravery and um, adventurous um, uh, mood, uh, Gilgamesh and Gumilov are pretty the same for me. And um, it's, I think it's uh, really symbolic that it was Gumilov who um, translated this epic and was the first author uh, to bring it to a Russian speaking reader. And uh, the final, uh, the final um, again a comparison between two heroes. Um, some part of um, English uh, translation of the epic, and uh, part from uh, Gumilov's um, poem *Remembrance*. Um, again, uh, I found that these two um, episodes um, somehow are similar. And uh, I'll read it and explain a bit. So uh, about Gilgamesh, him uh, to whom wisdom clung like cloak and who dwelt together with existence in harmony, he knew the secret of things and laid them bare and told of those times before the flood in his city Uruk he made the walls which formed a rampart stretching on. Uh, so um, Gilgamesh is not just a hero who defends monsters, uh, who fights enemies. He is also um, a sage and uh, in search of a uh, secret of existence. And he also is a builder and um, not just a builder of the city, but a builder of some um, world order because um, he not only uh, builds Uruk and uh, rules Uruk, he also represents some particular a uh, way of thinking and um, way of worldview. And again, Gumilov writes about himself that um, he had multiple personalities and among them is a builder. I am a builder which is working smartly over the temple arising in, ha in haste. Seek for fame for my beloved country as in heavens, so on the earth. Heart is scorched by non-extinguished fire till the day in which as made of light walls of new jerusalem will spire on the fields of my beloved land uh, so gumilov also um, wanted to see himself as a builder as a builder of new reality and uh, this image of uh, new jerusalem is like rook for gilgamesh a new type of thinking and a new type of perceiving realities. And uh, in this point, I think uh, modernist poet and ancient hero are um, similar and um, uh, they are like maids who connect through the ages. Uh, so for now, uh, that's all that I wanted to say. Kate, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating. Um, what a rich comparison of um, of two epic heroes in their in their own ways, separated by a couple of millennia. Um, thank you, and um, I think this is this is the time when we have a chance to ask questions. So, um, what I would ask um, uh, folks in the audience to do is simply to use the raise hand function and your name will pop up to the top and then you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question if you happen to have if you happen to have one so any questions oh um can i add something just sure uh, while yeah uh, i forgot to mention that uh, there is a website 
uh, devoted to mm. Gumilov's uh, work. And uh, there are English translations. So if you're interested in Gumilov's poetry, you can uh, follow the link and read his works in English. And um, because we had little time today, I didn't uh, explain elaborately on his works and uh, probably reading uh, his poetry will uh, give uh, more full picture for those who are interested. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for the for the link. So um, audience, all topics um, are on the table here. I, I asked Dr. Nikitsko beforehand whether questions about her experience doing her work in a, in a country that's at war and is being invaded, um, whether she's comfortable discussing that, and she, she is. Um, so anything you'd like to, to ask her about, um, not just the, the substance of today's talk, but also about um, uh, the current situation in Ukraine, that's also fine. So um, if, if no one else has a question, let, let me just quickly ask one. And um, Kate, if you could if you could just let us know, is Gumilov's translation of Gilgamesh um, still read today by people who, for example, by students who, who, who study um, the epic seriously and study it in universities? Or is it really something that's been um, replaced by things like Igor Dyakonov's more modern translation, more scholarly translation? Uh, actually, it's a hard question to answer because in Ukraine, uh, we don't have uh, a seriology and I uh, actually don't know um, anyone, mm. any researcher who could, uh, who teaches somewhere at university. And um, I think we don't even have like departments uh, devoted um, to this uh, Mesopotamian culture. Uh, mm -hmm. But I know that uh, there is um, uh, a researcher from St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, Vladimir Emelianov. I actually referred uh, to his works when preparing uh, mm -hmm. my research. And uh, he um, uh, wrote a book about Gilgamesh where he mentions Gumilov's translations and also compares uh, this to Diakonov's work. So I think uh, for a uh, serologist uh, in Russia, this translation is still relevant. And of course, uh, for those who research Gumilov's work, poetry and again, translations from different languages. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, audience okay. members, any questions? Seeing none, I have another. <laughs> uh, okay. So earlier earlier today, I was uh, reading Gumilov's um, very brief uh, preface, his introduction to the translation of Gilgamesh. And um, he makes a very strong point about um, reproducing the, the, the meter, the, the, the form and the rhythm of the original um, Akkadian text. Um, and I was just wondering what, what you make of that, because, you know, here he is admitting in the same preface that he doesn't, he doesn't read the language. He's using a French translation, um, and the transliterated Akkadian, um, parallel text that appears with that French translation. And yet somehow he feels that he still needs to be precise enough to reproduce the, the stresses in each line. Um, so I was wondering what what's going on there. So he he felt very free to change meanings, to um, to widen spaces, to amplify emotions, to sacralize the images. I mean, you showed really fascinating examples of that. And yet he he felt that he needed to be very precise about reproducing what what Russians call the stichoslazhenia or the versificatsia. Mm -hmm. It needed to be the same. Uh, that's that seems a little strange to me. Uh, yeah, uh, he um, referred to Vladimir Shelyka for advice, and probably Shelyka could uh, help him with the, the rhythm of the original text. Uh, but actually, for me, it's also a big question uh, that he writes about the matter. And uh, at first, I thought that he 
um, uh, meant French text, the rhythm of French text. Um, because um, I think that rhythms in um, French translation and Gumilov's translation translation are somehow similar. Uh, but if we talk about um, Akkadian text, uh, probably he uh, the only way he could uh, know about the initial rhythm and meter it's uh, from uh, Shileikos world who could uh, work with the original text uh, because no yeah no other ways or probably um, if he read uh, the exact um, um, edition of uh, French uh, version uh, that I used edition of uh, 1907 uh, probably he tried to read this um, left column uh, with um, transcription of this uh, QNA form to Latin uh, sounds and uh, Latin syllables. Probably this way. Uh, but mm. again, this uh, remains um, <clears throat> mystery for me for now. Mm -hmm. So, so the left-hand column of that um, of that French edition does not include stress. Is that right? It doesn't include accents. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, that's very interesting. We have a question from the audience from Prudence Carlson, who asks, um, did Gumilov subscribe to any particular religious faith in his personal life? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. And um, as an active person, as a person who had vivid interest in different spheres of life, uh, he had a transforming um, religious views. Uh, when he was young, um, there was um, a trend in the beginning of 20th century, I think it was in Europe, in the States, in Russia too, uh, a lot of people um, were interested in spiritism and all that uh, summoning uh, ancestors and all that practices. And uh, for some uh, time, Gumilov practiced that too. And there is a um, story that um, with a group of students, uh, they including Gumilov, they decided to summon a devil. And uh, all students got scared and ran away except for Gumilov. <laughs> and uh, there is uh, like belief that he uh, saw something uh, after this uh, summoning se uh, session. Uh, but uh, later he uh, turned to Christianity and he remained a Christian for the, last, uh, for the rest of his life. And even after the revolution, uh, when churches were destroyed and uh, priests killed, um, he openly uh, did a um, sign of cross. I mean, this uh, yeah, sign that Orthodox Christians do. And uh, when passing uh, through a church in the street, he did this uh, sign of cross even to show Bolsheviks that he is not afraid and he is ready to uh, remain Christian um, even after the revolution, after the proclaiming the atheistic um, worldview. So he remained a Christian. I hope I answered your question. All right, we have another question from Aaron. Um, and they ask, could you elaborate on acmeism and some of the movement's impacts beyond Gumilyov's life? So acmeism mm -hmm. as a movement, and once Gumilyov is gone, what becomes of acmeism? Um, uh, actually, acmeism, um, on the one hand, it was um, a really uh, white movement uh, because uh, it was um, a whole poetic school and a lot of young poets uh, wanted to join it. And a lot of poets and uh, translators, including uh, Vladimir Sheleko, he also write poetry, not just um, did uh, some translations, he also write poetry and uh, belonged to, um, not belonged, but was close to Acmeist movement. And another um, famous uh, poets and translators like uh, Mikhail Lazinsky or, or Georgi Ivanov, they um, at some point they all started and they were close to Acmeism. So a lot of younger poets of younger generation, uh, they studied um, at um, Acmeist, uh, with Acmeist, and they um, continue uh, implementing these methods. Uh, but on the other, other hand, Acmeism was a really, um, a thing for a really narrow circle of 
people, including uh, Gumilov himself, Anna Akhmatova, his former wife, Osip Mandelstam, uh, Sergei Gorodetsky, and uh, Mikhail Zinkevich, and uh, Vladimir Narbut. So six uh, poets, traditionally, uh, they are described as uh, true, true acmeists, the, the very acmeists. Uh, so on, on the one hand, it's a white um, circle of poets who were interested uh, in acmeism. On the other hand, uh, these uh, six poets. And after uh, Gumilov's death, um, of course, um, he was the organizer of movement and uh, he was um, initiating those meetings and discussions and theoretical um, works. Yeah, he wrote numerous um, articles on acmeism, trying to describe what is it and what are its principles. Uh, but after Gumilov's death, um, acmeism uh, stopped existing as a school, as a method, but its seeds and uh, its um, worldview uh, were still in works of uh, those who studied at, um, according to Gumilov's use, and a lot of uh, poets of younger generation, uh, they didn't call themselves acmeists, but they remembered Gumilov's ideas, and somehow they used uh, them in their poetry. So it continued existing, but uh, like traces more, more like traces, not like complete and uh, full movement, but more like a traces in the works of different poets. So it spread around the world. And uh, Mandelstam, Ahmatova, and uh, other three poets that belong to narrow circle of Acmeists, uh, they continue writing um, poetry too, uh, but they uh, didn't um, gather and they didn't discuss some theoretical moments, uh, partly because of uh, the age, because of the period that become it was uh, Stalin's uh, time and repressions and uh, all of them are just uh, turned out to be in different places and uh, in different uh, situations. For example, uh, Vladimir Narbut was executed too in uh, 37 and 1937. Uh, Osip Mandelstam was arrested too and died in um, one of his, uh, in, in one of camps, concentration camps for prisoners. And um, so after Gumilov's death, there weren't like the basis, the theoretical basis and um, the organization for meeting and discussing something. But the seeds of acmeism uh, were present in numerous works of numerous young poets. Gumilov managed to um, give the push and uh, give um, initiated tradition. And even uh, for poets of uh, 20th century, I mean, second half of 20th, uh, 20th century, um, Acmeism become a source of inspiration. And um, even in this period, um, poets used Gumilov's principles and methods. Any other questions from the audience as we as we wrap up here? Um, I I mean I I I think um, Kate, this has um, been a fascinating conversation, and I and I know you must be exhausted now because it's whatever it is three thirty in the morning <laughs> in oh, yeah. Kiev. Um, so thank you for hanging in there with us. Um, even though I know you are a night owl, but still, this is this is a little extreme. Um, I maybe I can just finish off by asking one last question, which unfortunately mm -hmm. is is a difficult question, and that is something you alluded to at the beginning of your comments tonight. You mm -hmm. mentioned that um, speaking to us about Gumilov is a an opportunity to talk about Russian literature, much of which has been banned in Ukraine after the invasion, and. I just wanted to ask you how how you deal with that in your everyday life as a Russianist, someone who has an academic specialty, a scholarly specialty of Russian poetry, teaching in a Ukrainian university, teaching Ukrainian students about Russian literature. What 
so what happens are you are you able to teach russian literature have you had to change what you teach and and tackle um non-russian writers i mean what do you tell your students how do you feel about this situation in which you find yourself uh well uh yeah i promised to uh, tell about the conditions um in which i work so i deliver my promise and um thank well, you gener <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, generally uh we um teach um the course of foreign literature literature uh, which includes uh, French, uh, German, British, etc., American. Uh, so if we talk about modernism, uh, we study um, writers, authors from different countries that we, we used to study. And those included Russian literature too. So during uh, one term, we could study, um, for example, Jack London, uh, Maurice Maeterlinck, uh, Charles Baudelaire, and, uh, for example, Nikolai Gumilev. So we included uh, Russian literature, it, it was incorporated in a foreign literature course. But uh, since uh, the war started, um, all uh, Russian writers were just excluded. Uh, so only uh, European and American literature remained. And uh, in our lecture courses, we are recommended to avoid mentioning uh, Russian writers uh, just uh, and just talk about any other European or American writers. Um, so, and um, a lot of people here, um, they actually even bring um, Russian books to recycling points, even uh, some uh, translations of foreign literature, for example, I don't know, classics or modern literature translated in Russian. Um, they uh, just bring it to recycle points just because it's translated in Russian. So, uh, I won't sugarcoat this, and it's really it really happens today. And um, I really feel uncomfortable um, because um, the scientific literature is also banned. Uh, we used to uh, refer to numerous um, uh, literary theory works and literary history works that uh, were written in Russia or in Soviet times. Uh, and uh, it's also banned and excluded. So now we have to search um, English literature, uh, literature in English, I mean, scientific uh, and theoretical, uh, or in Ukrainian, which is uh, not as numerous in Russian. And it also causes some difficulties uh, because uh, you don't have um, really um, complete um, um, list of scientific works that you have to explain to your students. Uh, for example, um, we won't mention Bakhtin or Lotman now, and uh, they are uh, crucial for uh, literary theory, and uh, we just cannot um, explain and talk about them because any student now can go uh, to headquarters and um, to Dean, for example, and complain about Mm, uh, Russian literature in program. So it really causes a lot of difficulties for me as uh, for specialists in Russian. Uh, but um, I try to search opportunities outside. For example, uh, I took part in a um, conference in Armenia and I'm going to take um, part in, in Armenian conference this year too, this October. And um, they welcome Russian studies, so I feel comfortable um, communicating with them. And I can also publish there and um, yet yeah, took part in conference and um, in Russia too, but it's better to hide that you are taking part in some Russian events or conferences. So it's like leading double life probably and mm. uh, hiding, yeah, hiding what you really do and uh, showing something else. Uh, you uh, mentioned my list of publications at the beginning. So now, apart from all those works about Gumilev, I have um, one uh, article about uh, American novel, um, which really also fascinated me. It's uh, The Terror by Dan Simmons. And um, so I- uh, I don't, you don't, I don't know. Think, oh. I don't think I know it, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, it's really fascinating and it's really 
um, echoes with what Gumilev wrote, wrote it with his poetic world. But no matter. So um, because we have to write um, some reports on what we published during the academic year. And of course, I cannot include my Russian studies in those reports. So I have to um, accumulate something about different um, and other literatures and uh, so mm -hmm. that I can include it in my reports. So yeah, it's like leading double life and hiding in some ways, but so far uh, there is no other way to do Russian studies in Ukraine, unfortunately. I see. That sounds incredibly difficult, incredibly painful. Um, and I know, I know all of us wish you well as you try to navigate that, that difficulty. Um, and w I just want to um, point out that um, one student, Tekla, has just asked a quick follow-up question. Is excluding Russian writers something um, that is officially enforced and is, a, is an official policy coming down from the university or from the government? Or is it just sort of expected because of the, the mood of the people? Um, and, and also, depending on, on the answer to that question, perhaps, um, is it, are you going to get in trouble for giving this Russian talk or talk about Russian literature? to an American audience like us tonight? It's a really, uh, your question is really funny because um, our um, um, I forgot how to say like Dean and um, our yeah. administration administration encourages us to uh, join international programs at foreign uh, colleges and universities and uh, cooperating with American uh, colleges is really <laughs> uh -huh. prestigious and it's uh, really uh, valid, but I don't know how would they react if, if I um, yeah, shared the information about <laughs> me talking of, of Russian literature um, as, as a part of a uh, program for American college, I don't know. Uh, but probably I won't just uh, uh, talk about this and um, I'll probably put it on my CV, but for another uh, countries, not for Ukraine. Uh, yeah, and um, about uh, mm -hmm, uh, yeah, about uh, the previous question on um, the official decision uh, on the level of the government, it's being discussed because they haven't decided, uh, for example, what to do with writers uh, who wrote in Russian and uh, lived in Ukraine. There are. Uh, numerous writers from Odessa, for example, like Elephant Petrov and um, Babel. Yeah, Babel, uh, Mikhail Bulgakov from Kiev. And no one knows what to do with uh, those authors because they wrote in Russian, spent some time in Russia or the, the rest of their life when they moved from Ukraine. Uh, but they are not, they didn't write in Ukrainian. Uh, so um, on the level of the government, we don't have any um, formed decision so far. It, it's being discussed. Uh, but on the level of uh, schools and um, universities, um, the administration just recommends avoid Russian literature so that students don't complain. It's just uh, probably a matter of comfort and safety for um, teachers and professors, because mm -hmm. if you get in trouble with those students complain, it will be long and uh, it will be discussed in uh, public space that you are a traitor and something else. Uh, so uh, most uh, teachers just um, prefer to avoid um, Russian topics. Uh, but uh, there is uh, a silver lining in all this. Uh, not all students really um, are ready to ban all Russian and um, a lot of them are still reading Russian books. And uh, last year I taught a course for, um, again, for modernism and um, late 19th century, beginning of 20th century. And I uh, offered um, students to find any writer of this period and to make a presentation about this writer uh, and uh, some students uh, chose russian writers and um, mm. and they decided to make the presentations about russian writers and i uh, feel absolutely okay about this so not all students really 
uh, want this ban and not students really um, demonize this Russian culture and Russian literature. Thank you. Thank you for um, sharing these impressions of the, of the current situation. Um, and with that, I think we should wrap up. And I know that um, the, the audience joins with me in thanking you for um, being so generous this evening with your time and with your expertise. Fascinating talk. And um, we are all, I know, wishing you safety, health, um, a rapid end to this war with all Ukrainian territory intact. Um, and we just hope and pray that you will um, stay safe and be able to continue to do what you do um, without feeling constrained about, about doing it. So thank you so much, Kate Nikitska. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was happy to see you.